We're here. Week one takeaways. I'm going to be dropping this series every Monday from now until the NFL season covering dynasty fantasy football takeaways from each week's slate. As always, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Let's jump into our first takeaway. Jamison Williams is here. He dominated in an island game in week one. And no, I'm not going to claim credit for this. I was not in on Jamison Williams at all. In 18 games across the last two years, he managed to earn just 51 targets. That is horrible. I mean, really bad. <laughs> Players like that never succeed. Literally never. If you can think of one who earned that few targets in their first two years and that many games played and then went on to be good, tell me, I can't think of one. But just because something's never happened before doesn't mean it can't happen. And we have to admit, and realize Williams had five catches for 121 yards, a touchdown on nine targets and a carry for 13 yards. He led the lions in targets in this game. He also played more snaps and ran more routes than Sam Laporta and just few tour routes than Amon Ra St. Brown. Neither Laporta nor St. Brown had a good game. Laporta had four catches for 45 yards on five targets. St. Brown had three catches for 13 yards on six targets. Of these two, I have more concerns for Laporta, even though he had a better game than St. Brown. The Lions are not going to abandon Amon Ross St. Brown, who they just paid $30 million, because he had one bad game. That's not going to happen. So what is my actionable move from this takeaway? It's by Amon Ross St. Brown. I mean, if there's any, any, any discount on St. Brown, take it. We are talking about an elite wide receiver, elite at earning volume in his, not even his prime, before his prime. Take it. Take it in Dynasty What if there's any discount, even a little. Takeaway number two. <laughs> and I feel like I could talk about 15 offenses that looked bad. So many. But this one is a five-alarm Fire. Bryce Young and the Panthers' offense looked horrific. Everything that could have gone wrong did go wrong. Young was embarrassing, embarrassingly bad. 13 of 30 for 161 yards and two interceptions. He averaged 5.4 yards per attempt, which is horrible. Took four sacks. His interception was a, the first one at least, was, it was laughing about it after. It means unacceptable. Totally unacceptable from Bryce Young. The Panthers wide receivers, they rotated snaps. All played between 33 and 43 snaps and ran 23 to 29 routes. None of them stood up, stood out or stood up or anything. And Bryce Young will take this entire offense down. The running backs look bad. Young looked bad. The receivers looked bad. The team was embarrassed by the Saints. It's a joke. A joke. The Panthers are were a joke in this game. Um, now, what would I do? I do think there is a bright spot in this game, and that would be Xavier Leggett. Deontay Johnson did not impress me in this game. Bryce Young will not be the quarterback if he keeps up this level of play. It was no good. Leggett actually led receivers in receptions and yards in his first game and was picked by this regime. So... If there's a stink on the Panthers because of Young and you can get a discount on Xavier Leggett, maybe just for one 25 second compared to his price in rookie drafts, I would be in on that. Our next takeaway. Puka Nakua's injury and the Cooper Cup revival. So, Nakua was playing well before the injury. I mean, he had four catches for 35 yards and a carry for seven yards and just 25 snaps before the injury. He was his normal self. But the injury feels like a re-aggravation of the knee injury we heard about in the preseason. At this point, I can't recommend doing anything particular with Nakua until we know how hard he is. What We have to know that information. However, I will just remind you of one thing. As a rookie, Nakua had 105 catches, 1,486 yards, and six touchdowns on 160 targets. That isn't a mirage. It's not possible. It is not possible to have that level of production and it be a mirage. It's not. 
So Pukunikawa is an elite player. You, it's not, we're not talking about someone like Chris Olave or Drake London who've never actually done it. Pukunikawa was elite as a rookie. He is an elite talent. It's not going to change. He will still be an elite talent at some point when he comes back. I'm not writing Nakua off in Dynasty, pretty much no matter what. However, for the short term, Cup had 14 catches, 110 yards, and a touchdown on 21 targets. It all exploded when Nakua left the game. Cup was doing fine before that, but once Nakua left, it felt like Cup had every target after that. If Nakua misses serious time, Cup is a league winner and a mid-wide receiver one the rest of the season. So, yeah, I, I love Cup rest of season if this is the case. However, I do think Nakua is going to come back relatively soon, whatever relatively means. Now, what would be my actionable move here? It's actually to add Demarcus Robinson. So, Robinson played the second most snaps of any Rams wide receiver. I know that Tyler Johnson outproduced him. And he'll be the wide receiver three while Nakua is out. Jordan Whittington and Tutu Atwell were not involved in the equation. Robinson, Colby Parkinson, and Johnson will pick up targets from Nakua out. But Parkinson, I think, is rostered in most leagues. Robinson could be the one who maybe was dropped with Whittington hype. And I, he would absolutely be someone I would add in all dynasty leagues and will be my second Rams wide receiver ranked next week, assuming that Nakua is out. Now, if you like my YouTube content, you should sign up for the Patreon at the top right corner. Patreon.com slash fantasy advice. You get my rankings, access to the Discord, and the ability to ask in advance questions for the YouTube videos. Tiers begin at just $6 a month and include all of that. I did a lot of start sit content, a lot of redraft content on the Patreon, especially in the Patreon Discord, and that will be where it takes place. If you want to know more about the Patreon, check out both of my Why You Should Join the Patreon videos on the channel. There's two of them. They're on the YouTube channel homepage. And look, I really appreciate everyone who signed up and any new patrons who join. Independent content is really hard to do, and supporting me is the only way that it's going to continue. So if you like what I'm doing on YouTube and want to see that continue, sign up for the Patreon and it will. With that said, let's jump into our next takeaway. Next up, Drake London vanished and Kirk Cousins looked shaky. Now, I don't know if Cousins was the worst quarterback of the day. He wasn't good enough. Went 16 of 26 for 155 yards, touchdown and two interceptions. He took two sacks and averaged six yards per attempt. It could have been worse, I guess. I will say the Falcons' offensive scheme was not the issue in terms of the personnel. In terms of personnel, all of their top weapons were out there consistently. Drake London, Kyle Pitts, and Darnell Mooney ran 28 of 28 routes. Every single time a route was run, all three of them were on the field. Those are their three best receivers. They were there. Each of them played 53, 54, and 56 of the offensive snaps. Drake London played every single one. So they rode their best players. Bijan Robinson played 50 of 56 snaps and had 23 offensive touches. He is probably their best overall offensive player. They used him like a workhorse. So it's not that they didn't use their best players. That That's not a problem anymore. The problem is that the players were not targeted. All three receiving rep weapons failed to deliver more than three targets. Pitts had three catches, 26 yards, and a touchdown on three targets. London had two catches and 15 yards on three targets. And Mooney had one catch and 15 yards on three targets. Where Ray, Ray Ray McLeod had four catches for 52 yards on seven targets. Now, I don't think that that is going to be normal. I think they are going to fix that. I am concerned about Kirk Cousins. But I do think people are overreacting a little bit. And we'll get into that. So there are some people I was, were saying that Michael Penix is one game away from going in. He's going to play next week. That's not true. That's not true or anywhere near being true. Well, at least not in my opinion. If you can get back more than you paid for Michael Penix when you drafted him, a 25 first plus, I would. The most likely outcome is still that Kirk Cousins plays the two years of his contract with guaranteed money through 2025. 
and Michael Penix doesn't get in until 2026. That is still the most likely outcome. And not that much has changed off of one game. So I would definitely look at selling Michael Penix for somehow a profit after not much has occurred. My last takeaway, J.K. Dobbins is back. He is. He led the Chargers running backs with 10 carries, 135 yards, a touchdown, and three catches for four yards. Gus Edwards had just 11 carries, 26 yards, and then one catch for two yards. And Gus Edwards was not it. Dobbins outsnapped Edwards, 33 snaps to 24. Now, however, my actionable suggestion is to put J.K. Dobbins on the trade block. Now, you might say, well, I, you like J.K. Dobbins. You've been talking about J.K. Dobbins as a sleeper all offseason. Yes, I have been. However, I did recommend that, and I did say it, but this is why. I think while J.K. Dobbins is healthy, he'll have some games where he looks good. This was one of them. I don't think we can count on him all season. If I could get, you know, a 25-second or even more for Dobbins, much more than he was worth this offseason, where during Kimani Vidal's season, Dobbins was worth nothing, I would absolutely do that. But he's a player I'm more looking to cash out on rather than ride. I think people still see the name J.K. Dobbins and think he was once an elite talent, and maybe he was, but I'm not sure that's ever coming back. And if you can sell for a massive profit, I absolutely would. At the worst case, explore the trade market. If no one sends you a good offer, just keep him. But I would put him on the block and see what happens. Now, there is some NFL news. I'm not going to cover every injury, everything on these Monday videos, but there are three things that I want to cover that are pretty well reported at this point. So let's jump into that. Number one, Dak Prescott signed a massive contract extension. It, it occurred right before the Sunday games. Four years, 240 million, 231 million guaranteed through 2028. So Dak's basically locked in there through 2028, and he's going to be with the Cowboys the whole time. For me, that makes CeeDee Lamb wide, Dynasty wide receiver too. Um, He's much more valuable with Prescott, and he has his own long-term deal. And I, um, yeah, I'm all in on CeeDee Lamb long-term. Next up, David Njoku, high ankle sprain. He had four catches, 44 yards, and five targets on 28 snaps before the injury. He was a clear top target. And still, just as a shine of how bad Deshaun Watson was, Njoku still led the team in receiving yards, even though he didn't even play half the snaps of the game. Unfortunately, I feel like this injury is a crushing blow for Njoku. We know that high ankle sprains linger and cause major disruptions. He's already 28 and on the edge of the dynasty value cliff. Unfortunately, this injury might push him over. So this just really sucks, is my take on Njoku. Lastly, Jake Ferguson, MCL sprain, dominated playing time before the injury. Three catches, 15 yards on five targets, on 35 snaps before the injury. In his place, Luke Schoonmaker split time with Brevin Span Ford. They're not worth adding in most leagues. If you're going to add one, it's Schoonmaker in deeper tight end premium leagues. But I've seen enough from Schoonmaker in his career to say that he is not it. So I'm not running to add him. Now, I always want to cover some Patreon questions. I only have one, so we'll get into that. Now, if a rookie goes off or shows high volume from week one, will that give you confidence to say they'll be a big part of the offense moving forward enough to start them the next week? It all depends on the role. Xavier Worthy went off but had only three targets. Brian Thomas scored a touchdown but only had four targets. There were actually no rookies that had a consistent high volume role in week one at running back or wide receiver. But there was one who did. It was Brock Bowers. Brock Bowers was heavily targeted in week one despite coming off the foot injury. He had six catches for 58 yards on eight targets, led the team in targets and receptions. Week one, off an injury, a tight end comes in and leads the team in targets and receptions. This is real. Brock Bowers is going to be a star. If you wanted to have Brock Bowers as your dynasty tight end one, I would not have a problem with that. Now, if you liked the video, make sure to drop a like and leave a comment with your thoughts. As always, the best way to support the channel is to subscribe, and don't forget to hit that notifications bell so you can be notified about all my exciting content as it drops. Of course, if you want my best fantasy football advice, it's available on the Patreon. Dynasty, Start Sit, Redraft, and more. Every sign-up helps support my independent content. But once again, thanks for watching, and I'll see you all later.